Welcome, citizens of the globe, to the Front End Heroes podcast, where we discuss all things villainous and heroic about the front end of software development. My name is Evan Payne. I'm a senior front end developer at Actimo, and with me, as always, is my co host, Scott Francis, a senior front end engineer at Porsche. How are you doing, Scott? Really good, Evan. Uh, good to be back on the show and um, looking forward to this one. Got a great great guest coming up. And um, yeah, another another crazy week. I'm, <laughs> I've, I've actually moved house this week. Um, nice. Like super, super crazy week. Uh, signed for the house on Wednesday, moved in on Saturday. Uh, having it decorated now, so just come to record a podcast for a bit of light relief. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad we can provide that for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, things are good on my side as well. Um, not a lot moving. People are on vacation. Um, I work with some Nordic folks and they are like, hey, it's summertime. See you in a month. I'm like, okay, I like that. Good, good my, uh, frame of mind. So yeah, today's episode is sponsored by Netcentric, an award-winning Adobe Global Alliance partner and consultancy headquartered in Switzerland with offices all over Europe, as well as Pune, India. They're currently hiring for a number of roles. So if you're looking, check them out. We vouch for them. We worked for them. They're wonderful. We are, as ever, so glad to have their support with this show. So today we have a guest. Her name is Maggie Appleton. She is a UX designer, art director, and anthropologist at egghead.io. Um, I'd like to hear a bit more about that last one. Maybe you can introduce yourself, Maggie, and let us know a bit about how you got into the tech scene to begin with. Sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, like I mentioned, I uh, you mentioned uh, I work at Egghead. Uh, we teach front end web development, um, uh, mostly JavaScript, React, you know, all the standard stuff. I'm sure you're very familiar. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mostly do. UX design work there, um, art direction. I did all the illustrations for a couple of years. Um, I've been working for them for five years now. Um, and I started just as an illustrator and then moved into more of an art director role a few years ago. And maybe like a year and a half ago, I was like, I think I want to be a UX designer. And I've like slowly started moving that. So I've been transitioning roles the whole time I've been there. Um, but the, I call myself a, an anthropologist also because I originally studied cultural anthropology for my undergraduate degree many years ago. Um, and specifically looked at digital anthropology. So the, the cultural like analysis of how we relate to digital objects and, you know, that includes online culture. What does computation mean in a cultural sense? What kind of symbols and do we use to understand it? Uh, there's like a whole range of things in there, but I'm really interested in, of course, the, the culture of programmers and web development and what it means to be a coder and how, how coding sort of cultures, um, come up. So that's kind of, um, the, the anthropologist part of it at least. Yeah. No, it's fascinating. And uh, obviously, uh, I think your work came into my like view field when looking at Egghead, but it might have also been around the stage you were doing some of the second brain kind of concept work and all of that. And I, I literally think it was I was looking for some way to explain that to someone else. And one of your illustrations came up. And then it, it, one, you have a distinctive style. So like, congrats on that, because not everyone can find that. But two, um, I think it's great that the work that you do is often in breaking down things from the complex abstract programming terms, literally and in sometimes into a different way of understanding and a different entry point in than just using words to explain. So um, I'm excited to delve a little more into that. We might start with the digital garden. And I say that because today's episode title is Fortress of Solitude, referencing Superman's hideout way out in the middle of nowhere in Antarctica, right? And it's this idea of your own knowledge and expertise is, is only accessible by you. Yes, you can communicate it outwards and stuff, but the way that you interface with what you know and remember is inside your own fortress. And while you can just have it be a hole in the snow, you can also take the time and effort to make your Fortress of Solitude a really cool place to learn and grow. So um, maybe we can talk a bit about that and you can give our listeners a little bit of an intro into Second Brains and Digital Gardening as well. Sure. Yeah, I definitely love that topic. Um, so, yeah, I mean, digital gardens and, and um, uh, also they could can be, be called like federated wikis is another kind of concept for it or wikis in general. Right. I mean, that even is, um, you know, Wikipedia, this idea of just interlinked knowledge. And then there's sort of various types of that. So when we say individual interlinked knowledge, that's kind of what the digital garden is about. Right. It's about okay, I have things I know, my interpretations of things, uh, and presenting those online in some format that other people can read. Um, 
and the digital gardening bit of it, uh, and I'll, I'll make sure I'm like citing my sources here, is the term digital garden um, was something that uh, Mike Caulfield is a researcher who I think he's currently at the University of Washington, um, who's been doing s- sort of work in how we um, curate and communicate information online for many, many years. And so he came up with this idea of a digital garden back in 2005, no, 15, that was 10 years off there, 2015 in this article called The Garden and the Stream, which is really, really great. And it talks about how interlinked knowledge um, lasts longer and is easier to browse than what we would either call, think about the stream is sort of the newsfeed, the Twitter stream, you know, the way that the internet kind of started to shift in the mid 2000s um, into this more stream based thing where it's all based on time and you're always just seeing what's newest and you're not kind of entering into information in a way that helps you jump between related content that uh, is evergreen over time, meaning, you know, it doesn't really degrade, you know, a Wikipedia article that someone wrote on Ghana 10 years ago, okay, maybe it needs to be updated a bit, but it's kind of evergreen and that you know it's it's always being tended and it's and it's solid information you don't need to update an encyclopedia that often so this whole metaphorical you know framing of how we interact with information online it's trying to move it into a more permanent interlinked we would call it like topographic so think of you know browsing the internet as if you're walking over land instead of being in some timeline where you're always just seeing what's newest in a stream-based information um, environment Hopefully that wasn't too many buzzwords in that explanation. <laughs> um, but to get a little more tangible on like a person's digital garden is this idea of you having a knowledge base that is public online that other people can browse that you're always updating and tending. And it is not based around time. It's based around the information and the content and you're supposed to browse it by jumping between related posts or related pieces of information, not just what did you post yesterday and the day before in that sort of backwards um, chronological blog flow that um, started up in like the 2000s as well. How much, um, I mean, it sounds like an amazing concept, like, but how much effort is that to, to tend the garden? Like it must be like the, the like the, as with an actual garden, like the, the more and more that the, the more and more that you get in there, like the more and more like tending it takes. So, so it's just like, it sounds like a full-time job on its own. Yeah, it, it does take uh, as a, a tactical approach. So uh, I have a bit on, so I have a, a digital garden where I sort of post things and things have stages of growth. So I'll sometimes post something that's like not totally done yet and I'll, I'll, I'll label it as a seedling. So people who are on it are like, okay, I know this is very rough. I know it's not that finished. Maybe I'll come back later. I'll often put signs on it saying, this is a draft, this is in progress. Like tweet at me if you think I should finish it. I do that a lot. And then if a lot of people tweet at me, I know I should go invest more time in that piece or, or blog post. Um, and then it can get upgraded to budding is sort of my second phase where it's a bit more formed. And then if it's, I've like really refined it and I don't think it's going to need that much more attention in the future, I label it evergreen. And I would only really go back to edit an evergreen post if it really needed some significant upgrade. But mostly I can kind of be like, okay, I don't really need to pay too much attention to that. So you, you can create, and I'm not the only one that's come up with these categorization systems. There's a lot of people who run wonderful personal websites where they have sort of doneness ratings or uh, some sort of status marker that shows you how finished pieces are so you can see work in progress. Um, having this sort of system means it helps direct your attention of where you should tend on your garden. Uh, and there's some things that when they're sort of, it's a bit like they're a big evergreen tree at one point and you go, we don't need to touch this for like mm-hmm. maybe five or six years uh, unless it really needs updating. Um, but it does, yeah, I, there's a lot of ways that if you, uh, if your garden is everything's constantly growing all the time and nothing ever gets finished, it could become a really labor intensive uh, chore to have to be constantly tending all this information. But there's an argument that's kind of the process of learning is you're always supposed to be going back and revisiting your old beliefs and your old um, statements about things and reconsidering, you know, whether they're still true, whether they're still valid, whether they need to be updated for new information you've gained since. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think like that's a that's an amazing thing about the web, right? Um, that's that it can continually be revised like that. I mean, like you know, a book is a snapshot. You know, you read a you know you'll read something and it's very much a snapshot in time. But the web is that's the beauty of it. You can go back and and update. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, and I I, I really like that um, idea of revisiting as well. So if you're able to track your understandings of things 
and then come back to it. So it's like, oh, okay, this is what I understand as an example for front end. This is what I understand to be the best practices around array manipulation, like, you know, taking arrays and dealing with the data inside them. And, you know, when I, back in 2015, that might have been, you know, you use a for loop and you find the index through that and you just do that. And then at some point, 2016, 2017, ES6 kind of took over with arrow functions and it was like, no, you should use map or filter or reduce. Then I would go back to that, my own like understanding article and just revise and say, well, you can do that. This is a preferable way. Um, my question within that is uh, once you've done it for a while, you've got like hundreds of, you know, pages and articles and things like that. How do you like, I mean, you, you already talked a little bit about giving it to the public to ask them to surface some of this stuff for you, but like, how do you like know it's time that, that, you know, this has maybe gotten stale or um, you haven't re- visited this non evergreen content in like a year, maybe you should check it out. Are there any uh, tools that you, you use for this? That's interesting. I probably should, or I shouldn't say should, I said that would be a really nice thing to have. (laughs) That'd be great if someone could, because like, I mean, my website's all on GitHub and it's, you know, most people's are, right? You could definitely look at, you know, write a little function script that says, okay, what haven't I touched in this um, amount of time that is labeled the seedling, you know, surface that again. That would be a really interesting, at least from the, like the author's point of view, tool to have. Uh, I have it a bit in that I use a an application called Rome Research to sort of manage a lot of my personal knowledge. It's it's kind of one of the like new hot note taking apps, you know, uh, that came that's come up in the last two years that does this sort of interlinked knowledge. So it's a lot about densely linking things, and nothing necessarily has a location. It's just one kind of one big knowledge graph, um, and the Rome platform allows you to write custom JavaScript to sort of query your database and, and pull things up. Nice. So I have a system where I can uh, see what I haven't touched in a while that um, I've marked as like in progress um, for, for ideas, what I might put on my um, public digital garden. Um, but it, I think it could also be done through a GitHub um, function. Um, that could be yeah. really interesting. I don't personally have one, but that would be cool if someone builds one. Yeah. That's the power of uh, the web. So if you're listening and you want to dive into it and set up an action or something, go for it. No, I, I bring it up because the side project I work on, I'm pretty sure now that I think of it was inspired by reading your articles there. And, you know, I think you even that pointed me in the direction of Rome Research. And like I did a kind of Rome Research for Dungeons and Dragons Game Master note taking. So it's very specific to what it's for, right? It's not kind of an anything goes tool, Um, but it has that same idea of, you know, you create your sessions each time you play, you write down your notes. And if you reference a place or a thing or a a non-player character or whatever, you link that to a record, you create a record for it, and then it's linked in the text so you can click on it and see the details. And I have two years of games that like sessions that I've been playing with my family, like 200 plus like sessions. It's really has been important to me to have this <laughs> like at my fingertips. So designing the tool and building it. And then when I encounter other people using it for different contexts, it triggers in me to ask questions of like, hmm, how, what else can I do here? <laughs> That's great. So are you using Rome for that or a custom built site with me? No, it's it's just completely, I, I call it my journeyman project, right? It's mm-hmm. it's all my own stuff built on top of Firebase mm-hmm. and Angular and all these other tools, which other giants, but that's software development for you, standing on shoulders of giants. Um, yeah, it's just taking off of the basic concept uh, of those mm-hmm. other kind of tools. That's great. So, I, I mean, a lot of what we've talked about so far has been a kind of way of thinking thinking about thinking or thinking about learning. Um, and so maybe that's an okay segue into uh, another thing that I, again, I've said already, I think you're really good at is breaking down complex topics into visual designs and languages. How do you even approach that? Um, and maybe now's a good time to bring up uh, just JavaScript. Um, you can tell us a bit about that and, and maybe use that as your example for how you <laughs> kind of made these illustrations to go along with it. Sure. Um, I'll definitely say uh, in terms of yeah, taking complex programming ideas and turning them into, with me, it's usually illustrated explanations. Um, is 
mostly it's it's absolutely born out of my own ignorance and like um naturally being a really bad developer and i like don't say that to just be like british and self-deprecating but like i am not naturally very good at abstract reasoning in the way that really good programmers are you know they can just read a whole text file and they construct in their head okay that function is talking to that function and there's all these variables over here and there's side effects happening i just i'm really bad at that so like um text-based programming i find incredibly difficult um and so when I first started working for Egghead, you know, I started playing around with JavaScript and I learned React and uh, the whole thing was a huge struggle. But as I was learning, I would take illustrated notes. And for me, drawing a visual makes implicit things explicit. I mean, that's kind of the, the beauty of it. It's like, I'm, you know, saying, okay, this variable in my drawing is a box so I can see it. It's like referenced on paper and, you know, I'm going to draw connections to other things and, um, it helps me to sort of build an imaginary world that feels more tangible. Like, you know, it's, it's me projecting metaphors that are based in physical objects. So it's like, I think this function is like a milkshake and I make up weird things, but they're relatable so I can understand them and remember them. Um, so all my work has been based out of me needing to understand something and explaining it myself through illustration. Um, so that was kind of how I started drawing um, programming stuff, maybe like four or four, I think four years ago, I started doing sort of illustrated notes on, on mostly JavaScript concepts. Um, and then that ended up leading to a project with Dan Abramov called Just JavaScript that you mentioned, um, where we're both based in London and he had seen some of my illustrated work and he had had this idea in his head for quite a while about the mental models of JavaScript. So that, you know, when a programmer, like, you know, when Brendan Eich wrote Just JavaScript, he had all these fundamental mental models that he built the language around, you know, it's like, object-oriented programming, which of course came from Alan Kay, you know, way back when, um, but he was, you know, pretending everything's an object and there's a thing called a function and he has these abstract structures, you know, that are kind of fundamental to lots of programs that he's using to, to construct JavaScript. And if your medical model doesn't exactly match his, you're not going to be able to write JavaScript correctly. Like you don't have the right abstract concept. And the, and I mean, as a UX designer, I kind of look at JavaScript code and I'm like, well, who would know from like reading a JavaScript textbook, like exactly how a variable works? You know, you're not going to go read like the um, TC39 committee's like actual spec if you're learning JavaScript. So like, how would you know what's actually happening? So the language itself doesn't explain itself. Um, so anyway, so Dan had this idea of like, okay, he deeply understands JavaScript. He completely gets the mental models. He's like read all the documentation. And he said, I have this idea of how I want to explain it visually. I want to show you know, like a variable as a shape of some kind and how exactly it attaches to a value and how a value is different to an object and we can make them different graphic symbols. Um, so I think it was two years ago, we first started like meeting up over coffee and talking about it. Uh, and he's been developing lessons and I would uh, draw illustrations and animations that helped explain each lesson. Um, we made a whole series of quizzes where, you know, you're sort of, you read through a lesson, you see some animations and then you're quizzed on whether you know how to draw the same kind of diagram that shows you understand sort of the execution order of JavaScript is really what it's teaching you. It's like when, you know, uh, your um, code is actually run, you know, what exactly happens when you say let A equal X? Like what exactly is the computer doing, uh, you know, in the at least in the JavaScript layer of it, you know, we're not teaching bytecode. Um, but yeah, that was, that was kind of that project's been incredibly fun because I was, really bad at JavaScript when we started and I have a much firmer grasp on it. I'm still like not great, but um, going through that, it got me to build up from the fundamentals with, with Dan sort of, I was like the first guinea pig of the material. I think that's super interesting. And um, I, it was also something that I really struggled with um, like conceptualizing, like just coding, like just understanding uh, things like that. Maybe it's, maybe we're Brits together and um, that's something we are bad at. But it was like, but honestly, that was the same, that was like a similar thing um, for me. I remember being at university and um, I, I did, I kind of stumbled into coding. Um, and one of the modules that I was doing was uh, basically uh, teaching me, like, oh, this is a variable. Um, and the, the guy just showed me on a screen and I was like, I don't get this. How does this like work? And then I, eventually I got it, uh, but then years later, I saw uh, years later, somebody else uh, was explaining what a variable was and to do it, they just picked up a cardboard box and said, this is a variable <laughs> like, and inside it is a ball. <laughs> the, the value in the, in the variable is a ball. Like, and I was like, 
oh yeah like i just need i just need some like physical representation of what this is and this would be so much easier like and i i think there's like obviously the illustrations that you've done like move in this direction but i think there was like there was some other video courses as well that i saw and there was even a i, I had a book like a while ago um where it was teaching like uh like a house um and inside and the house has properties like and the house has um it was it was just taking things into a more physical way and it was so much easier to understand it's just i think some people learn one way others learn another so to have like the option of that and like have the physical uh, comparisons is so helpful i i, I mean I, I also like i maybe i've lived in ireland long enough that i joined, <laughs> joined the club uh but like i didn't learn programming until i we had already moved over here to europe um, when I was in my mid middle twenties, um, I kind of had done some HTML before then, uh, and put some websites together, but not actual like programming until I was doing WordPress sites and PHP. And it's completely self-taught. Like we've said before, thanks to scotch.io and like some other stuff online, I kind of figured out how it worked, but even JavaScript was kind of, well, I know how a loop works cause I've been doing PHP, but I never did any study on it. Like I didn't learn the fundamentals. I just kind of figured it out and I didn't have a good mental model or whatever I did, it was pretty flimsy. Um, which is why I stayed away from using objects as much as possible. I stayed away from you know, class as much as possible. Even once it was like available, it just is not, I wasn't comfortable with it, but I took, um, the beta version of your just JavaScript, like last mm -hmm. year when sending out to some people to sort of experiment and start an early version. And there's this one explanation of drawing wires to these values like all the values exist already like there's an infinite amount but sure but they're they are immutable and they never change and they're there and you take your code and wire it up to those non-changing variables and that has stuck with me a whole year like you know like the new version came out and i bought it to be supportive and all i'm re-going through it and yep that is now my mental model it totally worked and absorbed it so um it's it's nice when you strike upon something that clicks for you as well. That really can help. Yeah, I'm really glad that helped because it gets really interesting when you talk about, uh, and, and I, I'll think of metaphors and mental models. I think of those fairly, kind of as the same thing. You know, we could debate some like sort of definitional, you know, differences between them. But, but really it's just talking about when I try to defend metaphors, it's when you represent one thing in terms of another, right? So you're trying to represent, you know, variables and we can use the metaphor of a, a box is one way to do it. Um, but there's a thing with metaphors where they, uh, you can talk about hiding and highlighting certain things. So like if we say, I mean, the classic one is like, you know, Juliet is like the sun, you know, it's like some Shakespeare line. And it's like, okay, you're highlighting the fact that this woman and the sun both radiate brightness or something, right? And and because they share those that quality, that's the overlap and that gets highlighted. And all the other qualities of the sun and the woman, like the fact that the sun is a burning ball of gas and this is like a female human, like all those other ones are like hidden, right? So you only pay attention to the things that it overlaps with. Um, so the way that this like ends up affecting the metaphors we use in programming is when we say, okay, variables are like a box. It means, oh, I can like put something in it. So that works really well. But then some metaphors are better than others we can talk about and not like one of them's wrong and one of them's right, but some have advantages or some highlight different qualities. So the one with, if you say variables of boxes, you can put multiple things in a box, right? You might argue that's the point of a box. Like you could have a box called A and you could put, you know, four in it and then nine in it. But then with a program like JavaScript, you know, the variable A can only be assigned to one thing at a time, right? It can either be four or it can be nine, let's say, you know, but it can't be both at once. So when JavaScript, just JavaScript the course, uh, and this is where when Dan and I first started working together, I like, drew a box, you know, and he was like, no, no boxes. It's, it's like a circle with a wire. And because if you have A and it's attached to four and you change it to be nine, you have to move the wire to nine. And like four is no longer in the picture. Um, so it, it's hard to explain without like showing the diagrams from just JavaScript. But even that, it was like, I was like, oh, wow. Like, okay, that gets at the quality of variables can only be assigned to one thing at once. Um, so yeah, it, it matters which metaphors we use, which got me really, I mean, I was already interested in metaphors of programming, but um, that one seems to be key or not one I hear spoken about much that these different metaphors can, you know, they'll highlight certain qualities and we can swap them around and the human brain has no problem applying multiple metaphors to the same concept. It's a bit like looking at a picture from different angles. It doesn't 
you know, it's not like you can't see the picture just because you looked at it from a different angle. So you can think of variables in through multiple metaphors, um, and it doesn't, you know, degrade your understanding of variables. It just helps you see the different things they're capable of in the program. Yeah, I feel like we've talked about that uh, on previous episodes here, um, which is great. That means it's it's a you know, recurring important concept of how you communicate with the people around you and what uh, what you leave out implicitly in your explanations or things that you're talking about. Um, and yeah, using whatever metaphor can be prone to, you know, not quite fitting perfectly and, or emphasizing the wrong things. Um, this isn't the best example, but one thing that always comes to mind is I didn't understand what a factory function did for ages. And you'd think it's right there in the name. It's a factory. Like you put something in and something else comes out, but it just didn't click for me. And I don't know what I'd call it. I don't know that there's anything necessarily better. But you know, when you're learning this stuff on your own, you you almost have too many metaphors at your uh, disposal. So it's it's good to have some guidance there. And I, I like that that you guys have done that. How 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 hard is it though for you to come up with the with the metaphors? Like I mean, like to to really like work through the creative process. Like is it? Um, I mean. I'd, I think we've. I think I've like dropped this in before, but I think it, it sounds to me like uh, another like creative process, like working in like um, like writing a song, for instance, like and actually coming up with like the perfect one and like the painstaking process. So, like, is that something that like really takes time, or are there like the more that you do it, is there is does it become more obvious like the, to to come up with the metaphor? Uh, I suppose over time I've learned good techniques for doing it. Uh, and I'll say it's like when I first started out, you know, at Egghead and, and my job at the beginning was they would hand me like a course name, like, you know, um, RxJS observables, you know, or, or, or JavaScript callback functions. And they'd be like, draw it. And I was like, oh, gosh, that's a good challenge. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> but it, it, got, it was really good because the first, I think the first six months, I was like, oh, okay, good. We're going to have to really learn how to do this. You know, like, how do I take something that is completely abstract and turn it into a, a visual that you can see? Um, so I kind of went on a deep research dive about how people design metaphors, and looked at a lot of editorial illustrators who work for magazines are really great at this because they'll have to do, you know, financial concepts or political concepts that otherwise have no physical form. Um, and really, most of the techniques that I, I researched from other people or came up with on my own uh, work with language. So you kind of, what I, whenever I start my process, I really just look at language. I just read documentation. And I'm really looking for certain action words, um, right? If you're saying like, you know, a callback is something, you know, that, that calls something and then returns something, you know, I mean, call, calling another function. So you're going, okay, so there's layers, it's calling something else, you know, we could use phones. And it's really, you end up just doing a lot of word association. And I also search through a lot of um, tools that are called corpuses. So they're just huge collections of language and then doing um, analyses of them. So you can enter in a certain word and see all the words that correlate to that word across, you know, major, um, you know, Wikipedia, newspaper articles, everything really that's written online in large collections and just start to see statistically what words we use, you know, two words after that, three words before that, uh, what kind of sentences that word is used in. And very quickly, you just organically find the type of metaphors that our culture uses um, to, to talk about things like something being returned or something being layered. Um, so you can go, okay, there's layer cakes, you know, or like, you know, we can talk about layers of the earth. Um, so there's ways that you can sort of search what's out there in the way that our culture uses language to find organic metaphors based off sort of the more core ideas um, behind certain programming concepts. So, mm -hmm. so I'd, I'll say that those techniques help me a lot in developing metaphors. Do you think um, you, you talk about our culture and traditionally that is very fractured when you like, you could be referring to anything like I'm, I'm currently uh, in, in Moscow and Russian culture is very different from how it was where I grew up in LA. Right. Um, but do you think that you're implicitly already referring to our culture as this sort of shared tech culture, which is much, much newer and has spread via a fixed set of languages, essentially, and a fixed set of programming languages often? Um, and now that is mostly what you've been like, it is a sort of maybe a happy 
coincidence that that is a very tangible global culture that's emerged. Yeah, I, I should be careful with the word our culture because yeah. Uh, yeah, I should definitely like position myself in that I'm definitely talking about because as sort of as the creator of these illustrations, I am British American. I grew up in Southeast Asia, but of course I'm very like global westernized, this sort of English speaking. So the sources I'm searching through are like, you know, the New Yorker, BBC, right? Like I'm definitely troving what is essentially very strongly Euro-American perspectives on on metaphors and, and things. Whereas I imagine if someone who only spoke Russian was was doing this work and was searching through Russian databases, they would probably develop very different metaphors or exactly the same for like, I know China has uh, an entire programming community and culture that is very much, not that it's insular, but you know, it's, it's very much works in the Chinese language, they code in, in Chinese. And so they aren't going to share a lot of the same programming metaphors and concepts that we might have. It's hard for me to say exactly how much they're sharing with us. But yeah, I would definitely think that because of my positionality and the Im information I sort of have access to, I can only really ever represent like a sort of Euro-American perspective on programming. Yeah, and, and and please, I did not mean to call that out in particular. <laughs> I, I, it's good to acknowledge our biases, of course. Um, yeah, I just think it's interesting that um, it does feel like there is a, a broader culture and it isn't uh, specifically stuck over to the European and, and, and the West necessarily. I mean, it's very Western, I think, often. But then there's a lot of share. Like, we've met programmers from Japan that, you know, uh, can at least follow along with these kind of metaphors. So it makes sense. Um, yeah, so to maybe delve a little more into uh, your own personal experiences lately. Um, how has it been for you making the transition into actually like doing some coding for, uh, you know, as part of your professional career? Um, how, how has that felt for you as a transition? Yeah, I think I only started, yeah, four years ago or so. I started learning properly. Like I learned HTML and CSS uh, at like 12 or 13, you know, and played around. But never really touched JavaScript. I just, uh, you know, I just didn't get really get into it. I kind of went the art and design route more and, and of course anthropology like through university. Um, and, you know, didn't, I suppose I was techie more and just but working in GUIs. I was never actually just touched programming. So yeah, it was only at like age 26, I was like, oh, I think I'm gonna try to like learn programming. <laughs> um, and I, I'll say it was, it's, it's been incredibly rough, um, only in that, right, like you, you put someone into like a code editor for the first time in their life and show them NPM and like Webpack. And like, I was just kind of thrown into a React database to try and like learn on the go. And, and it was like, I can't believe this is how we do this. This is crazy. Like, like the command line and, and there was no instructions and you just have to know who to ask questions to and sort of like troving through Stack Overflow. I mean, the whole thing, it's only because programming is so young, right? We don't really have any established institutions that teach people in a holistic way how web development works. But um, the piecemeal UX, I'll say, of getting into a development is really difficult. <laughs> um, so luckily, I know plenty of programmers at Egghead who've been really helpful and wonderful. And I, I, you know, now love working in React. And I built my site in Gatsby. And we, our Egghead site is built on Next. And, you know, I'm able to contribute you know, kind of front end UX stuff. So it's more like fixing React components and a lot of working in CSS stuff. But, you know, I don't touch like the back end. Um, so I've enjoyed it, but uh, I'll say like, I've now become a, an advocate for people who maybe aren't naturally inclined towards programming and the whole like no code and low code movement. And how do you get people who might not be um, drawn to programming to have the same power that programmers have? Because being able to program, right, is, is a little, you know, I know like front end heroes is kind of a joke, but it is kind of a superpower, right? Like you have a lot of power to be able to build your own business and deploy things and, and build infrastructure online that um, kind of runs the world now. So I think there's a lot of power in it and the, and the democratization that needs to sort of be worked on. So um, like if you only you only started say like four years ago, but um, how do you see the future for yourself? Like is, is, uh, do you see it more in code? Do you see that you would continue doing that and like really focus on that? And, um, or do you see yourself more um, in terms of like the UX or, the, or completely crossed over and like interchangeable between the two skill sets? 
Yeah, I think I'm definitely, I mean, I'm clearly like a hybrid sort of strange person and will probably continue to be. Um, I'm definitely very interested in UX and anthropology, but of programming. So very much trying to um, look more closely at how the, well, I'm, I'm mostly right in JavaScript well, but like it kind of can bleed out to other programming communities, but how the culture of programming communities affects what gets built and who gets to decide what gets built. Um, and also how, you know, that definitely how that affects the UX design of products. Um, so I'm sure I will always code because I love just playing around, especially with my own digital garden website. You know, it's very much like a form of self-expression to be able to build your own space and, and code pieces of logic for it. And I'm really interested in the future of the digital gardening movement. So I'm definitely interested in code to that extent, but, you know, I'm certainly not going to go learn uh, like, you know, Python machine learning or anything like that. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a UX code blend. Yeah, but I think that's great. I think that we are in this kind of, you know, renaissance of sorts where people can be craftsmen and they can choose what thing to specialize in and to pick up bits and pieces because there is knowledge all over the place and you don't have to learn Python because probably someone next week will build something that has a JavaScript interface to make some machine do most of the lifting for you. And then you just have to write a few lines to integrate it into your own branch. It's wonderful. It's magical. And yeah, I mean, we, we do, you know, name the show tongue in cheek, as we've said before, but it does feel like we have superpowers sometimes. It absolutely does. We can do so many cool things. I like that. I like that your idea, Evan, is that basically we just wait for JavaScript to take over the world, and like you don't need to. Yeah. Don't worry about those other things. We'll just wait for JavaScript to take over the world. As soon as that happens, everything will be fine. Yeah, <laughs> there'll be some very sad other programmers when that happens. I think it will happen, but everyone else is pretty mad about it. <laughs> I mean, even if it's not, it'll be something like TypeScript 19 has evolved in such a way that it incorporates as a layer on top of WebAssembly. So you're still writing JavaScript-ish TypeScript code, but there's stuff from Go and all the other languages, and it down compiles to WebAssembly or who knows what. Um, yeah, it's it's the future is wild, but at least it's not Wild West anymore. I feel like for a long time, it really was Wild West and everything was chaos. And it's getting better. I, I, I wanted to focus also briefly on your point there of, I, I felt the same way of trying to get my, my daughter to do some code stuff. It was like going through the front end master's course and it was like, oh, there's so much you need to do to even kind of get a hello world going. Um, not, you don't have to, but if you want to like make an app, let's say that people can use, you kind of have to choose a framework well, or at the very least, understand what you're doing with JavaScript well enough to deploy it. And then you have to probably touch the command line and you probably you're going to use a bundler because you've chosen a framework that needs a bundler and so on and so on and so on. It's people are making inroads into it. There are people that are trying really hard <laughs> to make this easier again, but we're not quite there yet, I guess. Yeah, Don't even having like the mental I, models I, I for all those things, like bundlers, the command line, you know, you ask any person on the street what any of those are, no clue, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I guess that um, like in in terms of like getting people interested in, um, I think that's the main thing. Like so you, people really need to start simple and not like get over complex with things straight away. Like, and... This goes to like the reason that you do your um, illustrations, Maggie, and the way that you started. Like, um, people have to identify how they learn. Like, that's that that for me is the key thing. Like, if you're going to start off, like maybe at 13, you don't know how you learn. But if you're retraining in something, like, then the first thing I would advise somebody is like, how is it going to work for you? Like, how are you going to, how are you going to learn something? Like, don't worry about it being code or anything else. Like, but how are you going to learn? Like, because maybe like, it's a strange example. I can't, I can't remember most things, but I can remember song words. Like I can sit, I could, I could remember a song. If I could make a song about JavaScript, like about how something works, I could pretty much remember that. Like, but if I read a, if I read just a straight up article, I would probably forget it by the time I'd got to the end of it. Like, so, like, 
it's for me the most important thing for anybody starting would be how do you learn like what is the best way for you to learn if it's through pictures then seek that resource if it's through if it's through learning song words then seek that resource out it doesn't exist but like <laughs> so, so so make it um but yeah that's the that's the main thing like just finding how you're going to learn something that's a that's a really good point too or, or it draws on one of my favorite kind of topics is like that and, you know, having studied anthropology, there's this whole thing of like, you know, humans have been learning things for, for tens of thousands of years at this point. I mean, if we really go back to like the original hominids and the vast majority of the things that like humans have learned and passed on through culture in like pre-written times is we would encode it in songs or in um, what we kind of would usually call embodied knowledge. So we have really, really great spatial um, understanding. So mapping information to space, like have you guys ever heard of... Um, there's called, something called a memory palace where you can construct a, you know, building or place mm-hmm. in your mind and you attach certain facts to areas of it in your mind. And we're really good at doing this with physical locations too, right? Like you can find your way around a city after you've only walked around it a few times because you have really wonderful spatial mapping ability and like your understanding of your body to other things in space. And programming takes advantage of none of that, right? We're reading like linear text in a code file and we're kind of constructing abstract connections in our head, but none of those are visual or externalized. Um, and they're certainly not in relation to our body. We're just like typing into a screen. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential into making computing more physical. I mean, people have been on this for you know many decades at this point, trying to put computing out into the world rather than keeping it confined to our screens. But that's like a really exciting place that you would hope in 50 years we're a bit further along in making programming more physical. So uh, again, imagination uh, takes takes control of my brain. No, but I I feel like there's it's possible. Um, so we have you know great IDEs like VS Code, right? And our square like rectangle screens like they're not good enough for this yet. And I don't really want to go into virtual reality. But if we were doing virtual reality, they've already drawn the connections from a file you're looking at, second brain like you and, and like. Um, in sense, you command click on it and it takes you to the place where it's defined at the very least, but it has all the connections. You know, you can right click on um, like a method or, or something you've imported all over your code base. You can right click on the definition of it and say, show me everywhere that this is used or implemented or whatever. That is a graph, right? That, that exists. And you can use that to make a 3D representation of it which is kind of what we do in our heads anyway. Like if I'm coding something and I say, oh yeah, I need to go over into the, you know, the store, um, like all of the side effects and things that you're doing with Redux, I need to do that right now. I've kind of placed it over there and like all the stores are over there. And once I'm in the store, all of them are kind of around each other in my head. It's just not visual, but we literally could make it visual. So we should, you know, contact some VR designers and ask them to do a proof of concept. <laughs> I feel like you've just done like some kind of, like in keeping with the superhero thing, you've probably just like invented like, well, something this Tony Stark would invent. Like this is, this is definitely going to be like an Iron Man thing. Yeah. Except, yeah, I'm not, I'm not Tony Stark. So there'll be something I forgot and it'll just fall apart the first time you try to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do love that when when programmers talk about sort of their embodied experiences of programming, because I've had programmers see, right, they'll enter a function, it feels like they've like dropped into like a different space, and then they exit the function, and it's like they've come back up. So there's all these ways that we feel it, it you know, embodied, because we're constantly yeah. just trying to understand everything through our bodies. It's just sort of our main way of interacting with the world. And programming just isn't at the moment, you know, like, playing into that or isn't designed to really take advantage of that. But yeah, um, I, I don't know if it'll be through AR or VR. It'd be great to just, you know, touch the wall over here and like fire a function or like be able to drag something and connect things up. I think you might get more tired. I'd like the idea that programming becomes like a manual labor job. You're just like attaching things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not in favor of that. <laughs> I, like that. I, did, I did a few days manual labor at the weekend and I'm not in favor of that. I'm, I'm glad to be back at the desk. That's fair. So I, I feel like we could talk for hours about this stuff and you know, um maybe maybe we can do, but uh for the podcast we keep it to a certain format. So moving towards the end, um we want to go into our segment True Hero. 
And in this segment, we like to highlight a few of the few true front-end heroes working across the planet and to thank them for all that they do. So this time around, you nominated Maggie one Brett Victor. Can you tell us a bit about uh, them and why you uh, want to call them out? Sure. Uh, so Brett uh, is very relevant to the conversation we were just having about embodied computing. Um, so the work they've been, they published a bunch of um, essays, I think between, I want to say 2006 and 2014, I think was the last time they gave a public talk, um, all about how um, the way that we use interfaces doesn't play enough into embodied knowledge and, and representing uh, things live. So it was kind of before we had as much live coding going on and they were really advocating for learning environments that show the learner exactly what their code's doing over time. Uh, so those essays are on uh, worrydream.com. So it's like worrydream.com. There's a whole bunch of really wonderful essays on there. Um, up and down the ladder of abstraction is a great one. Learnable programming is a great one. Those are sort of core cool ones. Um, and since 2014, they've been running a research lab. Uh, I think it's somewhere near Berkeley in California, or at least it's near Stanford, um, with, that is trying to turn the room into a computer. So they have sort of have um, cameras in the ceiling, and it's projecting light down onto programs on tables, and it's using um, machine vision to read them and then run programs. Um, it all sounds a bit futuristic. There's like, it's kind of, you know, secretive and there's some information about it online, but it's kind of this cool research lab that's uh, trying to make the room into a computer, which is a really beautiful idea. So I, I want to nominate them. If, if no one's read their work, they're really good to go look at. Awesome. Yeah. So Brett, thanks for all that you do. Please keep it up. And we're excited to see what comes out of your research lab there. Good. So um, lastly, any proper hero is a well-rounded one. And so we want to share some simple musical picks. Scott, what's the favorite thing you've been listening to lately? Um, well, let me just open Spotify and check out what yeah. I have actually been listening Spotify. to. Spotify, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Uh, an old album. Well, old. 2016. Uh, by a guy called Michael Kiwanuka. Um, uh, an album called Love and Hate. Like, like, I listened to this when it first came out, but I've for some reason been listening to that recently. And honestly, if you haven't listened to it, that guy has got an amazing voice. Like, um, yes. you should definitely check that out. Like, soul music, really, really good. Cool. All right. We'll check that out. Thanks. Maggie, how about you? Uh, I'm going to go with Jacob Collier, is a, I think, YouTube sensation is the correct term, but young yeah. um, artist. Uh, who I only recently found out about a month and a half ago. Apparently everyone else has known about him forever. Um, but he has an incredible voice. And there's this one song called Moon River on YouTube that everyone should go watch because it's like a it was sort of a religious experience of just incredibly beautiful music done by the sky. <laughs> yeah, I was late to the Jacob Collier party as well. Um, I think it was maybe about two months ago I discovered three. But yeah, mind-blowingly talented multi-instrumentalist and uh, like this crazy quarter tone dissonant harmonies that just work really like a musical savant. So yeah, I second that. Um, from my side, uh, I've been enjoying something I didn't necessarily expect to. Like I kind of fell off the Laura Marling, who's a British artist train a while back. I wasn't that, yeah. Early stuff was good, but maybe a little too in the angry, depressing zone for me. But she's come out with a collaboration with a guy named Mike Lindsay. Uh, the band that they have together is called LUMP, all caps, L-U-M-P, and the recent album Animal. And it's different, and it's good, and there's moogs, and there's like... It just is weird. It sounds like Stereolab and Tongue and all these like obscure British artists kind of like melded together. So really, really uh, uh, getting a kick out of that one. Good. So it looks like that's all the time we have for today, folks. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you should like, heart, or star us in your podcatcher of choice. Reviews and ratings are how the fancy algorithms help people find our content. The power to help is within you. If you have any questions or topics you want covered in our next episode, send a tweet to us at Heroes Front End, and we'll add it to our list. And until next time, Heroes, remember, with great front-end power comes great responsibility. See you next time.